A married couple drove down a country road for several miles, not saying a word to each other in total silence. An earlier discussion had led to an argument, and neither of them wanted to concede their position. Each thought they were right. As they passed the barnyard of donkeys, goats, and pigs, the husband asked his wife sarcastically, "'Relative of yours?' Yup, the wife replied, they are my in-laws. Everyone fights. Everyone has disagreements, misunderstandings, and conflicts. Whether it be between married couples, parents and children, close friends, siblings, co-workers, strangers, employers and employees, pretty much any relationship at whatever age, you will fight. There is this notion that Christians do not fight and should not fight. In fact, because of Christian love, we believe that there should be no conflicts or disagreements between Christians, whether between family or friends. But Scripture records many instances where godly people are in disagreement in the early church. I immediately think about the conflict between Paul and Barnabas, between Paul and Peter, and between Philemon and Onesimus. So in reality, Christians do fight even if everyone loves Jesus and is saved by His grace. But how Christians fight should differ from how the world fights because of Christ and His examples. As we continue our sermon series entitled Courage in the Crucible, studying the book of Joshua, there is a recorded conflict that arises between the tribes of Israel after the land had been allocated. And it may seem out of place. Why would a fight between the family of Israel need to be recorded in this book? I believe under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this incident is recorded so we can learn some biblical principles as it relates to fighting. And these principles applied in our lives will help us live courageously when we go through times of great trials and stress, as it is in those times that we seemingly have more fights. If you and I as Christians are going to fight because of our sinfulness, let us at least apply these biblical principles of fighting in order to provide the world with a Christian testimony. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Joshua chapter 22 as we take a look at verses 1 to 34. Joshua chapter 22, verses 1 to 34. I read now from verses 1 to 6. Then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, a servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. You have not left your brethren these many days up to this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren as He promised them. Now therefore return and go to your tents and to the land of your possession, which Moses, a servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan." But take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to keep His commandments, to hold fast to Him, and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. The Bible tells us after the promised land had been allocated on the western side of the Jordan River, for the nine and a half tribes of Israel, Joshua told the fighting men of the two and a half tribes of Israel who had land allocation on the eastern side of the Jordan River that they could return home. Remember, these fighting men from the eastern tribes had crossed over the River Jordan to fight with the other tribes in the conquest of the land under Joshua's leadership. Joshua left them some godly parting words for them to continue to follow the Lord in everything that they did. But in verses 7 to 9, he also gives them a very practical advice. Look with me. Now, to half the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan. To the other half of it, Joshua gave a possession among their brethren on this side of the Jordan westward. And indeed, when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them and spoke to them, saying, "'Return with much riches to your tents.'" with very much livestock, with silver, with gold, with bronze, with iron, with very much clothing. Divide the spoils of your enemies with your brethren. So the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, 
to go to the country of Gilead, to the land of their position, which they had obtained according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Joshua told these two and a half tribes that as they returned home with the spoils of war, that they were to return with lots of precious metals and livestock, but they were to remember to share with those who did not come to fight with them. Of course, while most of the fighting men of these two and a half tribes went with Joshua to help their brethren conquer the western side of the promised land, there would be many who presumably remained on the eastern side to defend the land, to defend the women and the children. These men would have stayed to farm the land and tended to the livestock in order to provide food for the eastern tribes and to care for the people. They should also share the spoils of war because they are also part of the war effort, staying on the home front and making sure that the families of the fighting men were cared for. So Joshua's admonition was to share, or else those who stayed and protected the eastern side would be jealous of those who had fought and now come back with so much treasures. What a practical and godly advice from Joshua whose spiritual advice to them was, number one, be careful to not lay the seeds of perceived injustice and jealousy. Be careful to not lay the seeds of perceived injustice and jealousy. Nothing will cause a conflict quicker in families and friends more than perceived injustice and a heart of jealousy. While nothing is fair in this life, it is important that as much as possible, if you are a leader or a parent or someone with authority and in power, that you set up an environment where there is no perceived injustice or favoritism that would cause jealousy. So as a parent, if you are dividing up your inheritance among your children, try to be as fair as possible. Because I've seen cases where a difference of $1,000 in distribution caused the family feud among siblings. Or if you are an employer, make sure you treat your employees equally, even if some of your employees are your relatives. Special treatment to a favored employee or to your relative will create a toxic work environment because of jealousy. That's why Joshua said to the fighting men returning east, Make sure you divide equally what you are bringing back with the men who stayed behind. My parents weren't wealthy, but they valued education. So they made sure that we three children got a great education and would support us through college. However, by the time I was 17 years old and starting college, I was independently minded and would not let them pay for anything as it related to my college expenses so as not to be a burden on them or to owe them anything. And so I worked multiple jobs to sustain the cost of my college education. My parents eventually helped to pay off the college loans of my older sister and my younger brother. And they offered to help me with my college loans as well. But I said there was no need. While not accepting their offer, I appreciated the fact that at least they offered. You see, it would have been perceived as being quite unfair if they didn't at least offer the same amount of tuition help as they offered to my sibling, even though they knew I was taking care of my own college expenses. It would have certainly planted a seed of jealousy or a perceived favoritism of siblings if they did not offer. But they offered and I declined, so it was not an issue. But if they never offered, knowing that I had everything taken care of, perhaps in the future... I would begin to wonder if my parents loved us all equally, if others were favored or not. Let's say hypothetically you are part of a very close group of friends with means, and one person gives a gift or food to someone, but not the rest of the group on a special occasion. While it is the prerogative of the giver on what to give and whom to give it to, if the rest of the close group of friends see that the one friend posted on IG or FB what they received to thank the giver instead of just through a private message, it is only natural for those in your close inner circle of friends who didn't receive something to wonder why and perhaps feel jealous. Of course, since the friends who didn't receive anything 
are people of means, they can buy the same food or the same gift item if they really wanted to. But I know that that is not the issue. There is now a perceived injustice without knowing the full context and the seed of jealousy grows. As a pastor, I have heard these true-to-life scenarios play out in many forms when people complain to me about this or that supposed close friend and what they did. I know it sounds petty, but these are the things that cause life's dramas, little things that are in fact inconsequential and which really shouldn't bother us, but they have a tendency to do so if there is a perceived unfairness which creates the seed of jealousy. So to avert any conflict, Joshua gives this wise warning to the two and a half tribes who were returning back to their homeland. In fact, we see Paul warning of something similar to the church in Colossae. Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So be careful not to lay the seeds of perceived injustice to cause jealousy. Look with me at verses 10 to 12 of Joshua chapter 22. And when they had come to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a great impressive altar. Now the children of Israel heard someone say, Behold, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan, in the region of the Jordan, on the children of Israel's side. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against them. As the fighting men of the two and a half tribes of Israel were on their way to the eastern side of the Jordan, traveling by way of the Jordan River Valley to cross the river where it would be most safe, they decided to build an exceptionally large altar there. The other nine and a half tribes got wind of it and heard what these men had built, and they were ready to go to war against them, assembling the army at Shiloh. Now let's note a few things as the tribes of Israel readied for war against their brothers. First of all, note in verse 11 how they only heard someone say what was happening. It was all hearsay. A personal visual confirmation was not done. This information was not corroborated. It was not verified, and they were ready to go to war. They also don't know why the fighting men of the eastern tribes had built this giant altar by the river Jordan. And yet, without knowing why, they were ready to fight and go to war. What was missing is the context. The western tribes thought that the eastern tribes were building a competing altar to the only one that the Lord had sanctioned to be placed in the tabernacle complex. And you can read more about this in the book of Leviticus, chapter 17, verses 8 and 9. There was only to be one altar where burnt offerings to the one true God was to be done, and it was to be in the tabernacle complex. So the assumption was that this competing altar was to burn sacrifices perhaps to another God, a false God, or it was a sign of apostasy in their rebellion against the commands and the instructions of the one true God. And for the sake of the Lord's honor, they would be willing to go to war against their own brethren. There was a lot of assumptions being made here. But that being said, positively, the nine and a half tribes should be commended because fighting principle number two, there are things in life worth fighting for if those things are God-commanded. There are things in life worth fighting for if those things are God-commanded. When it comes to God's honor, when it comes to God's name, when it comes to truth, when it comes to integrity, those are the things in life worth fighting for. This is important for us to remember because we live in a conflict-averse culture if it relates to matters of faith or to things of Christ. We live in a culture that doesn't like to confront or stand for Christian truth and biblical values. Now, we'll fight for other things other causes, other advocacies, but we shy away from conflict when we need to advocate for Christian truth. We won't fight when we need to fight. That's why so many of us don't do personal evangelism. We're afraid 
That's why so many of us don't stand up for Christian truth, because we are afraid. Any parent who loves their children would lovingly discipline their children with sternness and firmness, even to the point of fighting with the children because we know it is for their good, for their betterment. What parent would tell their children, you don't need to eat fruits and vegetables. You can eat ice cream and candy all you want because I don't want to fight with you. But we parents have to fight with our kids so that they will eat their fruits and vegetables. And we will have to fight with our kids so that they won't eat all the ice cream and candy every day. We believe that these are things worth fighting for. What about the things of Christ? Those are certainly things worth fighting for. For the sake of the Lord, you see that the western tribes of Israel are willing to fight for what they know to be right according to God's Word. It is sadly later in their history that they will no longer care to fight for God's honor and against wrong practices when the people of Israel begin to turn away from God because no one except perhaps the prophets wanted to say what was wrong is wrong and the prophets were generally ignored anyways. There are things in life worth fighting for. So when we talk about Christians fighting, know why they are fighting. Just because we are Christians, it shouldn't be used against us for wanting to stand up and fight if it is for the Lord. Of course, Christians in conflict and our fighting should do so with love and grace and apply the principles set forth by Jesus. But there is a liberty to stand up and be in conflict as we are to be in conflict with the world when God's principles and commands are being challenged. So if you are in a position of spiritual authority, there are times when you have to confront, when you have to discipline and take a stand, even if it leads to a fight. In the New Testament, the Bible talks much about disciplining members of the church who sin. And in the Old Testament, we see men like Daniel who are willing to fight the system because those in authority say you must disobey God. The story is told of a young boy who arrived home from school with two black eyes. His mother said to him, have you been fighting again? Didn't I tell you that when you were angry, you should count to 100 before you did anything? The young boy replied, I know, mommy, and that's what I did. I counted to 100, but the other boy's mother told him only the count to 50 and he punched me first. Christians, you don't need to count to 100 when the world is only counting to 50. You just need to count to one and fight the good fight of faith for the Lord. Remember what the Apostle Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called and have confessed the good confession and the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Look with me now at Joshua chapter 22, verses 13 to 16. Then the children of Israel sent to Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, and to half the tribe of Manasseh into the land of Gilead. And with him ten rulers, one ruler from each of the chief house of every tribe of Israel, and each one was the head of the house of his father among the divisions of Israel. Then they came to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, and to the half the tribe of Manasseh, to the land of Gilead. And they spoke with them, saying, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What treachery is this that you have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord, and that you have built for yourselves an altar that you might rebel this day against the Lord. It is good that before they went to war, they sent a delegation headed by Phinehas and ten tribal leaders to confront the fighting men of the eastern tribes who had built this giant altar. There were lots of assumptions in their accusations. They assume that these eastern tribes had committed a treacherous act against God that they had turned away from the Lord and had acted out out of rebellion to the Lord. These accusations show that everyone has a natural internal bias and preconception when we hear something about someone else. 
we don't assume the best of someone, it's sadly the case that we assume the worst of people, especially if we really don't like that person, and that is what's happening here. For example, if you were to see me eating with someone in a public place, one who is not my wife, you can think one of two things, good or bad. If you don't like me and are looking to catch me in a compromising situation so that you'll have something bad to say about me, you will say, look at that pastor, must be carrying on an unhealthy relationship with that woman, not his wife. Doesn't he know he shouldn't be eating alone with someone who is not his wife? Maybe I should take a picture and share it with my friends, leaving out the part that it was in a public place. But if you think highly of me, you may give me the benefit of the doubt and say, I'm sure the pastor has a reason to be eating with a woman who is not his wife. Perhaps the woman's husband or boyfriend happened to be in the bathroom at the moment, or perhaps she is his cousin who is visiting him from the U.S., or perhaps he happened to see her crying as she was eating alone, and he only came to check up on her to see if she was okay. Of course, this is only an illustration, and I try to avoid situations like the one mentioned for just that very reason that there are those out there who will assume and accuse. However accusatory the tone, at least the delegation from the Western tribes communicated before they took action. This passage doesn't teach us about ways to communicate, but simply that we should. Other passages in the Bible teach us how we are to communicate, to do so with love and grace when confronting someone with truth, as the Bible tells us to do so. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6 tells us this, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is head, Christ. We communicate with grace and with love, but we communicate truth. The delegation from the Western tribes continue in verses 17 to 20. Is the iniquity of payer not enough for us, from which we are not cleansed till this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, but that you must turn away this day from following the Lord? And it shall be, if you rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow He will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. Nevertheless, if the land of your possession is unclean, then cross over to the land of the possession of the Lord, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and take possession among us. But do not rebel against the Lord, nor rebel against us, by building yourselves an altar besides the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel? And that man did not perish alone in his iniquity." This delegation continues and reminds the men of the eastern tribe who built this giant altar that God deals harshly with sin and that the entire nation of Israel may be judged by God for their action, as did occur in their recent history, which are recounted in these verses. But I want you to notice verse 19. This delegation may seem to be confrontational in their communication style, accusing the men of sinning against God, but they were actually very loving and generous. They sought reconciliation. You see, they say in verse 19 that if the eastern tribes felt that they were too far away from the tabernacle, if they were too far removed from the rest of the western tribes, and they felt that their land was somehow unclean, that precipitated the need for the building of this alternative altar, then they could just simply move to the western side of the river Jordan and they would reallocate their land and give them some of their land for them. This showed the willingness of the delegation to resolve any issue that there may be. And it illustrates what is important in communication. It is that you are communicating with the intention to resolve conflict. In conflict resolution, you are not just simply communicating your idea to get the other side to buy into your argument you are communicating with the intention to bring the issues to light and work towards a resolution 
for reconciliation. And this is fighting principle number three. Communication with the intention to reconcile is key to conflict resolution. Communication with the intention to reconcile is key to conflict resolution. Communication is not a zero-sum game, where when you talk, you expect that the other party just simply accepts everything you say to be true and apologizes to you and gives in to all of your demands. You have to allow for grace and love and generosity, and it must be evident with the provision for a solution or remedy so that forgiveness and reconciliation can happen. If you don't see a way out of conflict or if a solution is not presented, then each person will simply harden their position and they will fight harder because there's no way out and they will communicate, but that communication will have no end goal. Everyone is simply shouting above each other, hoping that through their shouts they will be heard. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, give people a way out, a way to be restored. Look what the Bible tells us in James chapter 5, verses 19 to 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Then look with me at Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. It reads this, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, in any sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. So let's say hypothetically, you and your daughter are always in conflict, and she runs off with someone you don't approve of and as a child with that person. And it happens that the other man abandons your daughter because of the child out of wedlock, and your daughter returns back home to you. What do you do? Do you scold her and berate your daughter and tell her how wrong she was, how foolish she was to follow love's impulses, how she wasn't thinking, how she has now ruined her life, and you keep telling her, I told you so, I told you, I told you. If that is your communication approach, then the conflict and the fight will continue and she may leave your family forever. But if you say, okay, we've come to this point, this is the way forward. Here are the steps that need to be taken so that there is restoration because we love you and we do forgive you. Then you can see the possibility of reconciliation. Asians generally aren't very good at communication because openness is not a part of our culture. Sadly, shame undergirds a lot of our communication skills, and that exacerbates the problem. And because of our top-down respect for authority, then the you must listen to me statement is often said, or I told you so is very much part of our talks and our communication. But our example should come from our Heavenly Father, who communicates with us through love and grace, but with the expectation of righteousness and holiness. But if we sin, he says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that verse. Let me read it again. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Communication with the intention to reconcile is key to conflict resolution. Look at me now at verses 21 to 23. Then the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh answered and said to the heads of the divisions of Israel, the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, He knows and let Israel itself know if it is in rebellion or if it is in treachery against the Lord, do not save us this day. If we have built ourselves an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer on it burnt offerings or grain offerings, or if it is to offer peace offerings on it, let the Lord Himself require an account. The men of the two and a half tribes responded that they had done nothing wrong. 
they acknowledge that the Lord who sees all and knows all sees what they have done, and it isn't an act of rebellion against Him. But they took it well that the delegation coming is an opportunity for all Israel to know the purity of their actions before the Lord, even if their actions seemed like rebellion and apostasy to the other tribes. But note what they said at the end of verse 23, that it was the Lord alone whom they were accountable to. This is a great reminder that when we are in the midst of conflict and or fighting, our ultimate judge is the one who will call each of the parties in conflict to account. That means God decides not based on who is more spiritual or who is more righteous or who is, quote-unquote, more right. God judges individually each party based on His own criteria. So when Christians fight, they have a tendency to look to the Bible to make it out that their position is right. They may even claim that God is on their side. They may twist the Scriptures and even proof text to prove their points. And spiritual pride comes into play. And instead of resolving the issues, it becomes wrapped in spiritual justification. The ten and a half tribes of Israel had a spiritual reason to go to war. The two and a half tribes had a spiritual reason to build this giant altar. Both had spiritual reasons, and both could claim that they were doing God's will, and they were fighting on God's behalf, and God was on their side, and that they were both fighting for the name of God to justify what they had done. But to get above the fray, we have to remind ourselves that we answer to God in our individual capacity, and He is the one judge whose opinion matters. That should hopefully lessen the tension because we are then reminded that we are not God. We can't see everything. We can't know everything. And we do not know the intent of the heart. Only an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God can be the perfect judge. Let us understand this truth. We are accountable to Him. Now look at the reason for why the fighting men of the eastern tribes built this giant altar verses 24 and 25. But in fact, we have done it for fear, for a reason saying, in time to come, your descendants may speak to our descendants saying, what have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a border between you and us. You children of Reuben and children of Gad, you have no part in the Lord. So your descendants would make our descendants cease fearing the Lord. The eastern tribes were fearful that in the future, the descendants of the western tribes may forget how the land was divided and somehow justify in their minds that God put the river Jordan between them because the eastern tribes were not to have a part with those on the west. So perhaps in the future, those on the east would be prevented from coming into the land where the tabernacle was to worship God. Remember, it was expected by God in the law that at least three times a year, as Exodus chapter 23, verse 17 says, all male Israelites were expected to worship the one true God, wherever the tabernacle and later the temple would be. And it was on the western side. Look at verses 26 to 27. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build ourselves an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between you and us and our generations after us that we may perform the service of the Lord before Him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices, and with our peace offerings, that your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. That's why they built this giant altar. It was to be a memorial the men of the eastern tribes explained to the delegation it was not to be used for sacrifices, but to serve as a memorial that the eastern tribes were very much a part of God's covenanted people, and they had the right and privilege to cross into the lands of the western tribes to also worship the one true God, the God of all Israel. Look now at verses 28 to 29. Therefore we said that it will be, when they say this to us or to our generations in time to come, that we may say, 
Here is the replica of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made, though not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between you and us. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn from following the Lord this day to build an altar for burnt offerings, for grain offerings, and for sacrifices besides the altar of the Lord our God, which is before His tabernacle. They again explained to the delegation that they were not rebelling against God in the building of another altar of sacrifice. But this was a replica, and it was actually for a good purpose to serve as a reminder for the future generations. The men of the two and a half tribes of Israel affirmed that the Lord knew the good intention of their hearts in building this altar monument, and now all Israel will know that it is for good, not for bad, because they had a chance to explain the purpose of it. This illustrates another wonderful principle, fighting principle number four. Everyone has justified and even spiritual reasons for their actions. Only God's evaluation matters. Everyone has justified and even spiritual reasons for their actions, but only God's evaluation matters. When Christian families and friends fight, We all have reasons for why our position is correct. We even use the Bible. But unless it is clearly stated in the Bible, it is not about your justification using biblical verses out of context. It is about God's evaluation on the matter. Because you may be doing something right in the sight of the world, but as God peers into your heart, He sees that your motives are actually wrong or evil or what you may be doing may not seem right to the world, but when God sees it, He sees a pure heart which is in line with His Word. So before you and I are so quick to judge or to jump onto a side, let us try to look to the perspective of our Lord. And if we really don't know, we leave the matter for Him to adjudicate. What is important is if our heart is in the right place, then the Lord will take care of the rest. He fights on our behalf. He will vindicate if we have been wrongly accused or mistreated. If we give God our entire life, He will assess it and deal with it and take care of all of our problems. I like this modern parable told by Reinhard Monnick. A man owned a two-story house. He heard a knocking one day and opened the door and found Jesus there. So he invited Jesus to live in his house and give him a room in the top floor. Jesus will only take what you give him. The man was sleeping and heard a pounding on the door, opened the door a crack, and the devil barged in. He had a terrible fight trying to resist the devil and his temptations, yelling out for help all the time. Eventually, he managed to throw the devil out. In the morning, he said to Jesus, Jesus, why didn't you help me last night? Couldn't you hear me calling for help? Jesus replied, the problem is, You've got the whole big house to yourself, and I've only got one small room. The man said, ah, I see your point. You can have the whole top floor, and I'll keep the bottom floor. The man was sleeping and heard a pounding on the door, opened the door a crack, and the devil barged in again. He had another terrible fight trying to resist the devil and his temptations, calling out for help all the time. Eventually, he managed to throw the devil out. In the morning, he said to Jesus, Why didn't you help me last night? Couldn't you hear me calling for help? Jesus replied, the problem is I have the top floor, but you still have the bottom floor all to yourself. The man said, ah, I see what you mean. From now on, Jesus, the whole house is yours. That night, the man was asleep, and there was a pounding on the door again. This time, Jesus went to the door, opened it wide, and stood by the doorway. The devil looked at him, bowed very low, and said, I'm sorry, but I think I knocked on the wrong door. Have you given your whole life to the Lord? Because if you have, then He will take care of your problems. He will be the one to adjudicate. He will be the one to judge. Just make sure that your heart is right with God. Finally, look with me at verses 30 to 34. Now, when Phinehas, the priests, and the rulers of the congregation, the heads of the division of Israel who were with him, 
heard the words that the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the children of Manasseh spoke, it pleased them. Then Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, said to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the children of Manasseh, This day we perceive that the Lord is among us, because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. Then Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and the rulers returned from the children of Reuben and the children of Gad, and from the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan, to the children of Israel, and brought back word to them. So the whole thing pleased the children of Israel, and the children of Israel blessed God. They spoke no more of going against them in battle to destroy the land where the children of Reuben and Gad dwelt. The children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar witness, for it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. A major conflict was averted because biblical principles were applied. People who believed in the one true God came into conflict, but at the end, God was glorified. This altar would serve as a witness to all the tribes of Israel that the Lord is God, and God was honored in all of this. No lingering questions about motives and intentions, no misinterpretations for why this altar was there. All would know that it would serve as a reminder that both the eastern and the western tribes worship the one true God. They were all part of the covenanted people of Israel. And in this, God was glorified. My friend, this is what happens when we fight well according to biblical principles. All Christians will fight, and some are in conflict. But how we fight determines if we glorify God, and it serves as a Christian testimony to an unbelieving world. So remember, Be careful in not laying the seeds of perceived injustice and jealousy. Remember, there are things in life worth fighting for if those things are God-commanded. Remember, communication with the intention to reconcile is key to conflict resolution. And remember, everyone has justified and even spiritual reasons for their actions, but only God's evaluation matters. May we all take these principles to heart as we live this life, some of us in conflict, some of us fighting in the future. But even in these conflicts, may God be glorified and may His name be praised. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your Word. Thank You for these principles which remind us that when we are in conflict, we need to remember that it is Your name and Your honor that should be glorified. Father, give us wisdom from above to lay aside the spiritual pride that we might have, to allow for a pathway of reconciliation and restoration if we are in conflict. And I pray, Lord, that if we are going to fight, help us to fight for Your honor. Help us to fight for Your name. Help us to stand and fight against the things of the world because we are children of the Heavenly Father, and we are to be followers of Jesus Christ in all that we do. May you bless us and teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.